we have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a fantastic guest, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Professor, Doctor, and President Freeman Herbowski. He's the president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Uh, he has been there for quite some time and has proven to be an exceptional leader. Not only is he a campus leader, but he's also caught a huge reputation as someone focused on helping black students succeed. Ever, over the past year and a half, this has been a matter of a special interest to everyone in higher education. It's been something that we've been focused on here in the Future Transform. So to talk about leading a university and to talk about helping us support black students, let me welcome President Herbowski. Thank you, Brian. Thank good you. Great. Very good to see you. Thank you. I'm and now this is I'm glad that you've obeyed our background code of having bookshelves. That's <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's so many ways to introduce you, so many uh, achievements that I can point to. But since this is the future transform, I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself through the future. What are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the big topics and the big projects that are going to be top of mind for you? Sure. I, I don't think anything is more important than talking about our students and supporting our students. And I, I think the, the title you gave me for supporting black students is appropriate because a lot of my research focuses on students of color. But I start from the position that if you show me a university or a community college that cares about students in general, that will mean they will also support with specificity different groups, whether they're black or Latinx, LGBTQ, all these different groups. And so this future period for us, and I think for higher education, will focus on how to do an even better job in supporting these groups of students, in understanding their challenges, in supporting them by understanding also what they bring to the, to the campus, their strengths, to use that strengths-based approach. And, and most important on looking at ways of, I think, using technology as we work to seek the truth and to teach students how to think critically. And so there are a number of techniques we can use. I, I often use the language, though, um, from Jim Collins that says we should think about the genius of the and versus the tyranny of the or. In other words, it's not just about face to face or working remotely or teaching and learning remotely. It's not just about science and tech or arts, humanities and social sciences that we have to look at the genius of the end ways of integrating our approaches and the disciplines and the way we use disciplines in solving problems. And so the future, from my perspective, must focus on preparing our students to live in a world right now that in many ways is so divided mm -hmm. and in a world that is changing every day. And that's, that's why the idea of the broad education is very important, but also understanding that different people need different types of education at different points in their lives. Let me stop there. We can go from there. Well, that's fantastic. That gives us a great introduction into your into your uh, into your thinking, sure. uh, and into what you what you're working on, uh, friends. I'm going to ask um, uh, President Herbowski a couple of really quick questions, but the forum is here for you. I'm not the interviewer. I'm just the MC. Um, it's all your job to bombard our guest with, with your thoughts and with your questions. So again, if you're new to the forum or haven't been here for a while, those two main buttons at the bottom of the screen, there's the raised hand to join us on stage with video, and there's the Q&A box, that's the question. I, I, my, my first question uh, for you is one that I've been asking myself every day, and I think almost everybody has been. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are some of the lessons that you take in terms of supporting students based on this terrible epic experience of the COVID-19 pandemic. What, what have you learned that we should know about and, and apply? It, it, let me start with something that may surprise people. I've learned the importance of humility. Mm. I think I understood it some before, but, but, but mm. wisdom comes when there's that appreciation of humility. And for all of us uh, in understanding, we can never necessarily predict what the future holds that we find ourselves being challenged to understand more about who we are as individuals, as universities, as people, when the tough times come. Mm -hmm. And most important, um, if we are wise, we come to appreciate everything that others are doing to give us support at every level, 
at every level. Uh, you, you've put up somewhere on the screen, you had the name of our last book, my colleagues and I wrote entitled The Empowered University. Mm -hmm. Right now we're writing one um, that uh, focuses on what we've learned during this period about the extent to which we were either right or not quite right in the last book, The Empowered University. Mm -hmm. And the, the ways in which we were, I think, on point after listening to our colleagues and students on campus is that this was a period where we all learned how to listen more carefully. If we've been successful, how to listen more carefully to what our students were saying from all kinds of backgrounds, students of color, first generation college students, students in general, to listen to faculty and staff, especially people who were dealing with family challenges, starting mm -hmm. with children, uh, as well as other parts of the family, and to think about what we could do to be supportive of them during this difficult period. And then finally, um, listening to the fears that people have had and the, the mental challenges having to do, mental health challenges having to do with just stress and the crisis. I mean, and so I've said to colleagues uh, as I've listened that I am learning more and more about ways that we all can be supportive during this next period. It's been very important. And I, one other thing, um, while we all started off saying, oh, what a shame we're not able to do things face, face to face. I know many of my colleagues on the faculty would say, we've learned some things about teaching and learning in this process, okay. that things will not be the same as they were before. And even in face to face, we're gonna have much more emphasis on hybrid, on using technology in the classroom, on opportunities for some remote learning. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we've, become, we've learned to be more flexible and agile in thinking about how best to support our students. Well, that's fantastic. Um, that's, I mean, it's, it's, okay, we're done now. You know, this is, this, that's, a, that's a great, great list of, of all kinds of, of, of things that we really, really should bear in mind. Sure. Uh, just one quick question. Do you, how, how much do you think campuses are going to expand their mental health support uh, after this? I think we will have no choice but to, to expand mental health support and support in other ways. You know, you have in that title, Growing Support for Black Students. It has certainly been a time when we've had to listen, we've needed to listen to the reactions of our students of color, black students, and next students, other students, as they've seen how miserably we've handled so many things in our society uh, mm -hmm. during this period. And as they've seen us working to keep hope alive and to move to a better place. And most important, as we've all seen the light shining on all the disparities in our society, mm -hmm. from the academic achievement gap issues to the income disparities, to the healthcare issues in terms of health disparities. And, and quite frankly, campuses are now having to understand what it means to say that race matters, for example, we know gender matters, we know sexuality, LGBTQ, but but until a year or two ago, uh, we, for the most part, were very uncomfortable if we heard someone say structural racism. Mm -hmm. Now, experts would have been saying, yes, it's there, but the typical person would say, aren't we beyond that somehow? Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, it's been very clear for obvious reasons why we need to keep talking about ways in which, as a society, we discriminate against certain groups. Uh, more recently about anti-Asian sentiments and the challenges of that kind. And so what we've learned during this period of what we should be continuing to learn is how we should be listening to the voices of people affected and having robust and uncomfortable conversations about what we can do to move to the next level of supporting people. Wise words, very, very wise words. Thank you, thank you. And before I can ask another question, questions have already started coming in. Uh, so let me let me share one from our mutual friend and our mutual editor, Greg Britton at uh, Johns Hopkins. And Greg asks a powerful question. How do we support students around social justice issues like yes. the Black Lives Matter movement, especially when students are working and living remotely? Oh, it's it has been a fascinating experience and Greg will appreciate this because we talked about some of the things we did in the Empowered University. Uh, to build community among students. Some of you have seen my TED talk on 
um, success in science. But what we say about success in science, four pillars of success in science can be seen in general. And that's about high expectations, building community. It takes faculty, working with faculty, with students to pull them into the work and then evaluating what we do. And the high expectations part is the one that's not so obvious. We always talk about high expectations of our students. Hmm. The question is, how do we have high expectations of ourselves, not just in our teaching and in our research, but in our work with our students to hmm. open our minds and understand how they are perceiving the environment, mm -hmm. what they see as being definitely not in their favor, how they may be feeling peripheral in some ways. Uh, and, and, and so I would suggest that during this period, I know as we've talked with people in different on different campuses using that book, um, what has been really helpful has been to have focus groups with mm. different groups mm. to, and that's of students and then of faculty and staff on everything from issues involving politics. They have different points of view and and to, to even talking about how do you have the difficult conversations mm -hmm. to students, um, undergrad students, grad students who have certain challenges, black students in engineering or students of color in science uh, um, to hear what they are perceiving and how they are feeling about the experience. And then the other part that, that people don't talk about is how do we look to see how the students are doing academically? Mm -hmm. Because you see that academic performance will have an impact on what they think about the institution. And if they're not doing well and somebody isn't being proactive in helping them to improve through the supplemental instruction, through tutoring, uh, through focus groups, through building community, then people feel even more um, negatively about the experience. And that's that's what we're going to be going through. We went through it, uh, many of us went through it as we went through what we did this past year remotely. Um, and that's true for any campus. I mean, as I talked to presidents, there were still major concerns on campuses about social justice. Mm -hmm. The other part that I often talk about is the need to get our students involved as we come out of this remote situation, but even during it, in helping young children in cities and other places, hmm. black and Hispanic children. And so we had a number of our students who were working remotely to tutor kids in some of the schools in Baltimore. Oh, and wow. what it does is to put the challenges in perspective. There can be challenges on a campus and we can be more sensitive and more supportive and make sure that we're hearing those voices. But we also want to teach our students of all races about social justice beyond our campus in thinking about what's happening in our communities and how do we help young kids to become proficient so one day they can come to college. And that puts in perspective some of the social justice issues. I don't want those issues to only be on our campuses. We need to deal with the challenges on our campus, uh, on each of our campuses. I have a piece in the Atlantic from the past few months on how higher education should address structural racism. And the other point I haven't mentioned is our the professoriate has to become much more diverse. Uh, mm -hmm. Given the, the, the diversifying of the student body, we have to be creative. If, if people look at our STRIDE program, S-T-R-I-D-E, it's mm -hmm. focused on approaches to increasing the number of faculty from underrepresented groups. And people should know, mine is, I'm very pleased that we are a minority serving institution. We have students from 100 countries um, and about 20% black students. Overall, we are probably about half of color the largest minority group is Asian, actually. Uh, but we hmm. lead the country in produ producing black scientists. We're number one in producing black scientists, uh, bachelors who are going to get science PhDs and MD PhDs. And I, I promised my colleagues I would give people a reference um, to umbc.edu slash ripple effect. Again, umbc.edu slash ripple effect. And it is a, um, a website for the Meyerhoff program which gives uh, a sense of what we do to create excellence among students in the areas where American students tend not to do as well. That's in the science and engineering areas. I think you'll find uh, people right now um, in the forum community are, are frantically typing in uh, links and, uh, and sharing them. Uh, sure. Already we've been seeing people sharing this on, uh, on Twitter. Uh, Greg, thank you for that really, really good question. And Greg, Greg, if I can just say this one other point about that, to, specifically to your point, I think that any campus that wants to be successful in working with students of color uh, and all the issues we face, I say, and that's why I say genius of the end. It's about African Americans and Latino and Pacific Islanders, Asian Americans in general, but it's also about LGBTQ and then the gender issues. It's not one or the other. 
There are times when we need to focus on one. This is where we had great conversations on my campus when people were saying, well, you're talking about black students here. Well, there have been other times when we've talked about issues involving women, which we should be doing, and these other groups. During the time of George Floyd, the emphasis was on Black Lives Matter because people had gotten to the point in our society of thinking, well, there's a president of the United States, so race doesn't matter. I actually had students on my campus at one point say to me, well, you're president of UMBC and President Obama's there, so why should race matter? Well, we are exceptions. There have always been exceptions who've done well. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, but the question is what's happening to most people? And so I'm suggesting that this coming year will be one in which institutions, all types, will have to face these challenges because the challenges are real. We're talking about all kinds of reforms in our society, but even when policies and laws are changed, it takes years to implement so that people on the streets necessarily see some of those changes. And so all of us will need to think about ways of continuing to have the difficult conversations and looking at best practices, um, the Myhoff program, for example, uh, and others that we've developed that are now being replicated on other campuses. Well, thank you. Uh, this is this is fantastic. This is uh, an embarrassment of riches. Uh, so many programs, uh, and if, if you're again, if you're new to the forum, by the way, uh, Greg's question was an example of a Q and A question. Now, what I'd like to give you an example of is a video question because we have our longtime friend from the West Coast, uh, George Station. Let me bring him on the stage. And by the way, uh, Professor um, Korbowski, George said that you gave him a homework assignment which he failed to accomplish. <laughs> I wanted to make sure that we had the full humiliation of that. On, on uh oh, I think we just. Hi, George. Uh, I think George just froze up. Um, uh, I, I like a little humor in things. And so, Brian, that before you use the term, you would beam them up. And I, of course, I thought about Star Trek. Everybody knows that. It's going to beam people up to the stage. <laughs> well, I want the sound effect here. Right? I want the. Okay, there you come there. <laughs> uh, George, I, want... I think he may have a connection problem on his end. Um, I'll, I'll give him a minute more. And uh, oh, great. Uh, you, you seem to be there, George, but you're a little staggered. Yeah, I, th I think he's got a uh, bandwidth issue on his end. Right. Um, so can he ask the question without having his video up? Uh, he can. He can ask it uh, um, through text. So I'll just send him a note about that. Okay. Um, um, but uh, for everybody else, um, uh, George, just let us know when uh, when you can. Um, and we had another question that came in uh, from uh, Keenan Solinero, uh, who just uh, chatted. Should we also be looking at how to create a different way of doing things? from a different worldview, such that mental health outcomes are not the natural progression. You know, we should be rethinking how we do most things. You know, we've done a lot of tele-counseling, tele, tele mental health, mm -hmm. but our VP for Student Affairs and others have been talking about the need for wellness. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're actually just, uh, she just texted me a few minutes ago, the picture as we're coming to uh, fruition with this completion of a new wellness center. Uh, and so thinking about um, it broadly mental health, but wellness and on many levels uh, and finding ways of bringing resources to the campus that can help us to help our students and colleagues, faculty and staff. This will be a period of transition for everyone in so many ways as we move back to campuses since most were not on campus fully. Uh, and we will need to be again asking questions, a lot of questions and listening and making sure the environment is one where people can say what they really think as we go through this, this process. You know, I just had a meeting with some of my colleagues who were talking about uh, wanting to make sure that people who have gone through education remotely this year are yeah. as, as well prepared as necessary for the next year's work. How do we measure that to make sure that that's the case? And if there are some gaps somewhere, how do we use supplemental instruction to help with those? And so it's about mindset, it seems to me, of saying we're in this together with our students. It's not just, no, you should have learned this, this, and now you have it. No, if you didn't get it, if something didn't work it quite as effectively, we need to find a way to work with you to make it help, sense, help make it work. Similarly, when thinking about mental health, partnering with other groups. We've been doing that all along and even more so in the community that can be helpful to us depending on the challenges that people face. And in, um, uh, our student affairs people have been very creative in working with groups that involve addiction 
and working with them for, for some students who needed to be in housing involving uh, recovery programs at the same time. So it's looking at the particular needs of students and seeing how we can address those needs and creating an environment that will ensure that people are comfortable talking about their problems. You know, mm -hmm. now students are much more comfortable, particularly when they're from more advantaged families of saying, I come in with this addiction problem of that, all right? Um, many students, working class students, sometimes middle class students are not accustomed to thinking about therapists. Yeah. And mental health counseling. And they think, what do you think? I'm crazy. No, 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 no. We all need help in different ways at different times. And so for many of, and part of the book talks about culture change, mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. about how do you change the culture so that people are not embarrassed if they're having an anxiety problem, but can talk about it and get the help they need. And that's what we're going to have to be proactive in doing. And so his point is well taken. It takes a lot to change the culture of institutions. Kenan, thank you so much for that great question, uh, which is a very deep one. And again, uh, thank you, President Herbuski, for a, a rich answer. I, I love the uh, external partnerships as well as that openness to people being able to speak. We, we just got a, a, a question from George, and so let me just read this out. Uh, he said, can you say more about retaining your social justice mission on campus in the view of challenges? And the challenges are, first, from the previous White House with its executive order, and now state by state with how black history should be taught, critical race history, et cetera. Sure, um, there's several things. Thank you, George, very much. I'm very respectful of you. Uh, several things I would say. Number one, institutions will need to look at the structure on their campuses that will be responsible for focusing on this issue. And one of my challenges to campuses is that that, that focus on social justice should not simply be the role of committed minority staff members. Mm -hmm. That we need faculty, professors, some of whom may have those areas as their expertise, others who just have an interest, but we need to think about how are we focusing on issues of social justice, not only in co-curricular activities, but throughout the classroom situations, in what settings, in what classes, in what courses will students have exposure to these questions and how can we, re we reinforce them? We have an equity and inclusion council that was set up a couple of years ago and I talk about that in the other book. Coming first out of some Title IX issues that we had, mm -hmm. we could be much better than we were. We thought we were doing a great job. Turns out we had more work to do. And I think that's a part of learning that I don't care what campus it is, uh, we need to admit we can do better. I don't know a campus that can't do better in some of these areas. Uh, but secondly, and making sure that council uh, reports to the president's office through our chief of staff and that we have uh, key faculty and staff members and students on the council and um, to bring up these issues and to have a relationship between that council and the provost's office who is responsible for all those academic initiatives. And so the question about structure, uh, the question about how do we go about evaluating level of effectiveness and most important, um, what's the level of priority of those conversations, of those initiatives on the campus? Hmm. When something is important, you invest in it financially, money. You have time set aside by people who are the major influencers to be involved. And then you have the difficult conversations because we can't get everybody involved immediately because there's, there's always some backlash. But there are enough allies that you worked at. We did the same thing in talking about diversifying the faculty and we have a long way to go. We've begun to get a presence of, of uh, one or two black faculty members or several Latino students in a number of departments. We uh -huh. still have some departments with none, uh -huh. you know? And so I think speaking the truth about it, that we have a way to go. We've done a better job in educating African-American students, not just in science, but also in the humanities and social sciences and students in general. Um, and that we're still working to diversify the faculty, which is a part of the issue involving retention of students, social justice issues, um, but also issues involving gender equality. And as we think about our, 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 our LGBTQ faculty. So okay. I think it's possible to give appropriate attention to each of these groups, as long as we're giving respect to each of these groups and listening to their voices as we're discussing these kinds of issues. You mentioned- Finally, 
This is one of the, our Center for Democracy is really focused on social justice and large enough, and the Shriver Center. We've got these entities on campus that are focused on work, not only on voting, but what happens after we talk about the whole vote. Uh, the, uh, and the idea, what do we do after the voting has taken place? How do we get involved with the infrastructure in our state, for example, and beyond to make a difference in policies? Uh, and so all of these are initiatives that focus on keeping us grounded in that work involving social justice. We actually have it in a part, as a part of our broader mission statement that, so that it becomes the DNA, a part of the DNA of the institution. Excellent, excellent. I'm um, sharing out a bunch of links um, to a bunch of these, including your Center for Democracy and Civic Life. Yeah. Uh, George, thank you very, very much for that excellent, excellent question. I appreciate your patience and um, and and working through the technology. Uh, and that's just a, a fantastic answer. Um, I mean, you just gave us a whole series of excellent, excellent plans to follow. Uh, we have another question that comes in from Ohio University. Uh, this is Bob Klein. Let me bring him up on stage. Hello, Bob. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. It's good to see you again, President Hrabowski. Good to see you. It's nice to see you beamed up to us. Abs right. Absolutely. I, I, and my particles all seem to be intact here. But you, know, you said earlier that uh, you know, there's a, a, an issue here of assessing the graduates uh, you know, as a result of the pandemic. It seems also the incoming first year students, you're talking about half a generation that's going to have gaps potentially in their learning as a result of the pandemic. And especially, uh, you know, for me, the, the, the pandemic um, uh, really exposed the differential access by locale, by race, by ethnicity, by so many things to Internet and learning resources. Uh, you, you know, that's a huge issue. How are we going to deal with that as, as mm. uh, universities and leaders of universities to come? Mm. It's a great question that we should be th thinking about people who've not had the advantages and that all, on so many of our campuses, that is the case. We are looking at ways of assessing where they are in their education when they come uh, and, and, and the ways that we have done before, whether we're talking about verbal skills, math skills. But but most important, um, we we focus heavily on our academic success unit. We've got a unit that looks at where students are uh, and what they need. And um, in, in making sure we effectively placing them in the right courses in that first year uh, and then monitoring them carefully. Um, this is where the use of technology can be really helpful in addition to the personal touch. So we've been using analytics for years, but we've now moved into using machine learning and data science uh, as an approach to understand with greater intimacy the student experience in classes and outside of classes. And most important, getting to know our students, getting to know them. And we, we have got 14,000 students um, who are, um, we have about 11,000 undergrad and not quite 3,000 grad students. We've got another seven, 8,000 in a training company, which does a great job of getting to know students, veterans and others for programs in that way. But for the traditional students, the fact is that amazingly, the, the more we put them in groups, so you have a, you form a, form a community to make sure students don't slip through the cracks, the more effective you can do. So we've gone at UMBC from, we say this in the book, from 30 some percent graduation rate after six years to 70 percent with another 20 percent we can account for because they went to programs we don't have. So we know we are, we're reaching the students. And so the key has been, though, making sure they're connected to some group on the campus. And yeah, we've become much more residential, it's true, but still uh, of our freshmen, 80% um, will be on campus, but in students in general, it's only about half on campus, the others are not. So many around the campus, but, but the key has been, whether they are residential or commuter, what group are they connected to? How do you make sure they're not on their own? Because students who are not assertive and who are not secure will just think it's on me. We've worked hard to change the culture to say everybody needs tutoring at some point. You know, in high school, uh, talented students think, oh, I don't need any help. I don't need any help. Right. Uh, but our approach is very different. And we want. And so even our classes, we have these innovation grants that focus on teaching and learning and heavily focus on collaboration. 
and connecting. If you look there, they actually named the program after me after my 20th year as president. I didn't like it because I said people get things named after them when they're dead, right? So <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't excited about this, but they were able to raise money. So they, if you look up, if you Google Rebowski Innovation Grants, you'll see where they, a lot of grants, is particularly for the lower level courses in ways of connecting disciplines, but most important of thinking out of the box about different ways of helping more students to succeed. And so for me, most important, assessing where they are when they come in with some level of specificity and then meeting those needs by thinking about experiences they might have. Sometimes it's a supplemental course, a piece of a course you put together. We do a lot of that. And just as one example, there have been classes where many of the students didn't quite get up to the B to get to the next level, but they were close. And so we were able to develop parts of courses based on what they didn't get let them take that in January so they could keep moving ahead. We've got to do much more of that kind of thing. Very important. Thank That's you. Question, Bob. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just uh, going from a graduation rate in the 30s to the 70s. That's tremendous. Very proud. And no, no difference in graduation rates between Black, White, Asian, and Hispanic. That's probably the big deal. Wow. No difference in graduation rates. And I'm very proud to tell you that of my African, about 2,000 of the 14,000 are black. Um, but of the African-American students, half are male. That's the other issue that we don't talk enough about. Mm -hmm. Most places will have many more women, and we're very glad to have those women. But the black male gets left behind, or the Latino male sometimes. And interestingly enough, we are half of the black students on campus are male. That's been a very deliberate effort to have that kind of balance. Wow. Yeah, that's a big change. What, what's the total gender breakdown at UMBC now? It is about 52% men, 48% women. We're always looking for more women. We're always, and that's because we're half science and engineering. We have a center for women in IT, women yep. in, in IT and engineering. So we have ambassadors working to build the numbers of women um, in those disciplines. But we want more women in the humanities and social sciences. We especially want to make sure we keep some balance in the residence halls. Most of you know, if the residence halls becomes too male, you have much more physical destruction. That's what the research shows. Yeah. For that reason and for the obvious reason, it's really good to have gender balance. Well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to mess with the gender balance right now here um, and uh, by inviting Mark Brenneman uh, up to the stage. He's uh, from the University of Maryland College Park, oh. where he's assistant director of classroom technology. Okay. Let's see, Mark. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can be up. Yeah, All on. right. <laughs> Hi, uh, Mark Brenneman here from University of Maryland College Park. Uh -huh. So I, I was, as I was listening to your talk, this might be egg on my face because I missed some of the first chunk of the the session. I apologize. So if you already answered this question, just like shove me off stage and move <laughs> on. I'm wondering if there are, are opportunities to link these types of programs across the University System of Maryland. You know, I know Dr. Pine says his list of programs that we're trying to develop over here and work on. So I'm wondering if there's any way to collaborate on that. If so, I'm wondering, does that add too much bureaucracy? Like, does it make sense to really keep it localized or is there some some kind of effort across the universities? And I'm hoping the System of Maryland at the top level is yes. fully supportive of these, these types well, of programs as well. It's a great, our, our Chancellor Jay Perman talks about systemness and working to work together. And Daryl and I, the president of College Park, are good friends. In fact, we just announced um, uh, College Park is leading, but we are partners here in this work in artificial intelligence. This got this $68 million grant with ARL. I'm really pleased about that. And that will be for research and training. And Daryl himself has been a major player in bringing that about. We're very proud to be the partners on that. But we do have NSF funded programs for graduate minority programs of um, uh, the Promise Program is across campuses with the Medical School Downtown, College Park, UMBC, but also with UMES and some of the other HBCUs. So we do have some of those in this. And then at the undergrad level, we have the Alliance for Minority Participation, which includes those other campuses. Now, the Maher program is not being replicated there, but both Chapel Hill and Penn State have replicated the Maher program with funding from Howard Hughes. And we have a science piece. If you look up science uh, and replication of Maher, you'll see that article. And then we have replicated, we're in the process of replicating the Meilhoff at UCAL Berkeley and San Diego with Chan Zuckerberg money. If you look, uh, and you'll see, if you look up replication, Meilhoff replication, you'll see that. 
So w- there are programs that have been replicated. Um, we are pushing this model for students in science and engineering, particularly of my hall. Uh, the more of that, the more. And and but I will say that both uh, in looking at the top ten producers of blacks who are going to get PhDs in STEM, UMBC and College Park are there. Both of us are there. We're very proud to be number one, but College Park is definitely on that list. And with the exception of one other institution, I believe University of Florida, the others are HBCUs. Uh, so we are in that list, but I can say we can all do much better. And then it sounds we- like, oh, I'm sorry, it sounds like some other universities are seeing some effective models. Oh yeah. And kind of okay. use, you know, so. using those, so that's great. Yeah, right. and we need we need to be replicating models all over. We really do. Uh, and I will say, uh, and and uh, you know, the president of College Park had been the dean of engineering there, and so uh, UMBC. I just got the new data. I'm writing an article on this now that uh, for producing blacks who go on to get bachelors and going to get PhDs in engineering, um, NC and North Carolina A&T is number one. Morgan is number two, but UMBC and College Park are, are, are tied for number three. And then below us, you've got Georgia Tech and some other places. Mm-hmm. So um, um, we're making progress here in the state. Now, the point I would make about all of us is we can do a much better job. I mean, I'm challenging national agencies and foundations and saying, take those. If we took the number of the top 30 institutions, for example, in producing blacks who get PhDs and we double those numbers, we would increase the number in the entire country by 25 percent. And if we did the same thing for Latinos, we would actually increase the number by 45 percent. So having a laser focus on those who are already doing a good job to make help them to do much better and then replicating can make a big difference. I would argue the same thing should be true in the social sciences. If we got to diversify the faculty in the humanities and social sciences, we need to be producing more students who are going to get PhDs in those areas also. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, no, great. Thank you. Great question, Mark. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I appreciate uh, the uh, the point towards systemness, which we used to yeah. uh, do. Yeah. In, in the in the chat, Joe Murphy just wants to toss on observation. He says there's really good work being done on systematic improvement with Howard Hughes Medical Institute funds. Yes. 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 Aaron, the president, is is excellent. Um, Mike Summers, who is our Howard Hughes investigator, has led the replication efforts at Chapel Hill, Penn State and out at Berkeley in San Diego. Really nice story. The program, um, the C program at Berkeley uh, is going really well. And um, uh, a, a wonderful woman, Dr. Dotner, has just, who is a Nobel laureate, has just donated the, the Nobel Prize, that money to that C program just, wow. just recently. It's very impressive. It really is. So people, people do care. That's the point. Very impressive. Very much so. And you've talked about partnerships and reaching out, and we can see that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It makes a difference. Um, you know, as a president, I will tell you, I'm always shameless in saying I'm always looking for more money so we can do much well, more. <laughs> well, that's your job. That's your job. Uh, we, we have more questions coming in. I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to ask. Uh, and this is one that comes from Shannon Dowling at uh, Ayers St. Gross. Uh, and Shannon asks, do you think the physical virtual space matters to student belonging and success? And with that, what does an inclusive classroom look like in terms of design? I appreciate that, Shannon. The uh, and we uh, experts from your place uh, have helped us for years. Joe worked there, our, our chief architect for years, and others um, have helped us. In first of all, with the outside space, uh, I, I, I would give your firm credit for giving us a lot of support in working to build community physically on the outside. And because I had the chance to give keynotes about diversity to the American Institute of Architects um, twice in the last 20 years, um, I've gotten support from you guys in thinking through what we've been doing in the physical planning on the outside. And then more recently, as we have worked on innovation and collaboration, what we've worked to do is several things. Our, Our new interdisciplinary life sciences building focuses heavily on flexibility and equipment that can be used in a variety of settings and technology that allows us to beam from one room to another easily and for faculty to work collaboratively that way. And so having the technology that that allows you to get into different spaces can be very helpful, the virtual spaces, but also um, having space that encourages conversation and interdisciplinarity and Um, comfort level in solving problems. So our chemistry discovery center 
was one of our first major facilities renewal. If you look up the CDC, it, it's not for disease. It's Chemistry Discovery Center, UMBC. It's focused on improving chemistry in the first two years. And what you'll see will be tables, around tables with um, six people at each one, each with uh, technology there. Nobody's using paper and pencil or anything like that. Uh, and it, every person has a role from the provocateur to the, the technologist, um, the, the leader of the group, uh, someone else to help facilitate in the work, the scribe, and, and um, students are getting real-time feedback from a professor who is uh, somewhere in the room. And so the, the notion of having times when people can talk to each other rather than simply looking at the, the, mm -hmm. the person can make a big difference. Or quite frankly, if you look at this setting, I can see the faces of people. I can see how they're responding to what I'm saying. Uh, and, and, and I can also though, get from them feedback in that process. And we learned a lot about the use of virtual spaces in communication during the past year that will be helpful to us in the time coming up. I sent a letter around to my colleagues from one of my professors of literature who taught a course on happiness, a seminar on happiness. And she wrote to me saying, I started off knowing that it wasn't gonna be the best situation um, and trying to figure out how to make it as good as possible. She said, and now she said, I've had more in-depth conversation with people who have been able to talk to me from their, their 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 bedroom, their living room, or whatever, with me in my living room, mm -hmm. uh, and somehow our mindsets changed, and we connected more as human as human beings, even than we had face to face. Wow! And our point to me was, we should not be so presumptuous as to think that the connection is always better face to face. Yes. Uh, and my TED talk talks about the fact we 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 screen out, we weed out the majority of students of all races in science in the first year, in science and engineering. I, I chaired the National Academies Committee. Two thirds of Americans of all races leave science and engineering within the first year or two. And it's heavily because they didn't do well. It's not because they want to go and make more money in business. They didn't do well in the coursework. And so the point I'm making about virtual spaces, but about this period and using remote learning is we, I think many people have learned we can be so much better, even in the face-to-face -face, as a result of what we've done through the technology. That's a great, great feedback, Luke. Um, and uh, Shannon, thank you for the question. I just uh, threw a shout out to uh, Air Synchros on uh, Twitter about this, uh, as well as a link to your uh, 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 Chemistry Discovery Center, which sounds fantastic. Thank you. Uh, friends, we have, uh, we're have we coming up on the very last part of the hour, so if you'd like to uh, share your questions and thoughts, um, you're, uh, this is the time. So the floor is open. You've already seen what it's like to have a video question or a text question, and uh, I'd like to share a text question from a, another longtime uh, friend and supporter of the program, Roxanne Riskin from uh, Connecticut. And Roxanne asks, as a mindfulness educator, I'm excited to hear about your new wellness center. Another topic. Have you included campus climate challenges and any initiatives directly in impacting campus community? Oh, very much so. We've been doing a number of surveys. I appreciate the question, Roxanne. A number of surveys of students, of faculty and staff to understand how people are perceiving the environment on many levels about many issues from race to gender, sexuality. Um, but also uh, we're having conversations about what we're learning through the surveys to give people a greater comfort level in speaking the truth in saying what they really are seeing or, or experiencing. And while we are encouraged by some of the good stuff we hear, we're also challenged by, and I'm encouraged by sometimes when we hear something that says we're not doing so well, because it says people feel comfortable in telling you, no, we can do better at this. You know, we knew, for example, that when people said, listen, um, Many of you are older administrators, so you don't know what it means to have a little kid and you're trying to teach at the same time, you know, remotely. You know, it was so important for us to hear that and to think about what are the things we can do to give young families support, you know? So, um, uh, yes, we are doing those things. But I also want to say I'm a very strong believer in mindfulness. I'm using it in many ways myself with my students. I'm doing the Calm app, for example. So I meditate every day for sure. I'm doing Tai Chi. I mean, it's that human experience. And, and we talk about these things. How, and this isn't related to mental health and to just health in general, that 
that I don't think we should separate all the time what we're doing in the classroom or right at the university from our broader lives. And so everybody knows I'm studying French. I've been studying French for several years, which is Paul from say, avec mes étudiants. Uh, but I'm also doing um, the, the, the Calm app, my own medication, and the Tai Chi and, and acupuncture. Um, and I think being broad educators, yes, we should be thinking about the liberal arts, but we should also think about how we live our lives and how we talk about as leaders. Every educator is a leader how we talk about how we make it to the next day. How can we inspire people to keep hope alive? And it's gotta be, yes, about that which is intellectual, but that which is on for many people on many levels spiritual and that which is involving just the life of our, our, our inner life, I would call it, our inner life. I'm even using Noom right now, I'll say that, as a mindful technique with eating, uh, just because it's the idea that you keep learning. That's the point I wanna get across. We should all keep learning. And our campus is one that has a lot of, groups involving yoga and wellness. And um, we celebrate that, that they, the, the broad thinking about who we are as human beings. Wow. Um, Roxanne, you asked a fantastic question. Good question. Um, and and uh, um, President Horowski, you went in a, in a great direction with that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we've had uh, um, uh, a lot of support here for your uh, your your comments about uh, how we can learn more about the physical from the virtual experience, mm -hmm. uh, and we've had uh, some nice uh, nice tweets celebrating some of your key points, including uh, about listening, yeah. uh, which uh, I, I hope we get to do as much of here. Uh, By the way, we call it Retriever Courage, Retriever Courage, and we started doing that after a protest about some issues of needing more resources in Title IX. And I was the first to say it, thought we were doing a great job. We've got to do more. And, and Retriever Courage, remember the name of our dog is, is uh, True Grit. It's, and he's a Chesapeake mm -hmm. Retriever. So we have Retriever, if you, if, you, if you Google Retriever Courage, you'll see all kinds of stuff where we are saying we can be better, but we must listen to each other and understand what we're saying. Yeah. That's a, that's a great thing. Um, Oh, I love that. You can't go wrong with a good dog model. That's a, that's oh, yeah, a yeah. yeah. And we call UMBC the house of grit, the house of grit. It's all about resilience, getting back up. Uh, when we beat UVA several years ago in that basketball game, it was so because we're such a nerdy campus. So beating the, the very wealthy and powerful UVA as the first number 16 seat, even me, the nerd, even I as a nerd got it. And we were all so excited. And I want everybody to know we just became national champions in mock trial. Very excited. We, UMBC beats you. Why is that important? It's important for our country to know that as a person or a university, you don't have to be rich to be the very best. Mm. Mm. You don't have to be rich to be the very best mm. intellectually. I'm not talking athletically now. I'm glad about the athletics, but intellectually, I want my working and middle class students to know they can be the very best. We just produced the first black woman to produce a, a vaccine, Dr. Kismikia Corbett. She's one of my graduates who went on and got a PhD from Chapel Hill. We've never had in the world a black woman create a vaccine. That's huge, it's huge. Mm -hmm. And we should celebrate that because that says something to young women, to girls, to people of color, that it can be done. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, you mentioned to me that uh, my alma mater, the University of Michigan, uh, UMBC sent uh, the first black female chemist, I think? Oh, no, she is, uh, Lola is the first black female professor of chem chemical engineering there. Oh, well, I'm from UMBC, PhD from University of Pennsylvania. She's now an associate dean there and a full professor of chemical engineering there. And that's one of our challenges, working to produce more students who go on the faculties around yeah. the country. Yes, well, that, that's terrific. Yes. Uh, I guess I, my question I'd like to put to you is, you know, looking ahead uh, over the next, say, five or 10 years, and we've just lived through an extraordinary experience, I'm wondering, you know, what does higher ed do you think look like? Right, right. I mean, is it, are we going to be this much better at teaching, this much better at listening, this much better community involvement and student support? Uh, what, if, is, what does it campus look like? I appreciate that. If we continue to be attentive to each of these issues and give, give both our time and resources to the teaching and learning process to support faculty in rethinking how we teach, to teach students how to learn, all right? Mm -hmm. If we continue to focus attention on social justice issues, not just for black students or for students of color, but for our country, the more the future has to be that universities 
help the entire society to know that unless we do more to help our children who come from families where two thirds in general have never had anybody graduate from college, and then large numbers of families of color, we cannot continue to progress as a society. And so I think, and then unless we can teach our, our students to be even more enlightened than our generation has been, mm -hmm. so that we are able to discern the truth, to present our arguments and give evidence, as Fred Lawrence says from Phi Beta Kappa, and to listen carefully to other perspectives and then find that common ground. That's what the future is gonna have to hold, that we are learning how not to be so divided and how to begin to close those gaps, income level, health disparities, universities, community colleges and universities. And I wanna give community colleges credit, they are producing more than 40 some percent of, of all the students in higher education right now. I was fortunate to co-chair the Aspen Prize just recently and just was amazed by the work they do to focus on students. And so more and more, we need more attention on students, on use of technology in communicating and supporting each other and using all these different techniques, data science, machine learning um, to understand the students. But broad, big picture, we must be seen as a major part of the problem solvers of the humankind challenges. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's why I'm so glad to say my graduate, a young woman out of rural North Carolina, creates with Bonnie Graham a vaccine, leads the team to create this vaccine. That's huge. Look at the name, Dr. Kismikia Corbett. Uh, another one of my students, Dr. Caitlin Sattler, S-A-D-T-L-E-R, is the um, the person leading the campaign and the, the, the study in, in the country, NIH, on asymptomatic COVID patients. Because oh, a wow. lot of are asymptomatic and we and they're trying to understand what is this involved. It's gonna be very important. She's got a yeah. TED talk and her TED talk has twice as many hits as mine. I was lucky to get over a hundred, a million hits. She's got 2.5 million hits and she's twice, she's wow. one half my age. Caitlin Sattler, S-A-D-T-L-E-R. So I, used, I often will put up those two graduates, one white, one black, young women, great scientists to change the attitudes of society both out of working middle-class families now leading in the country, leading in the world in helping with public health. Fantastic. And that is a great, great direction for the future. Uh, friends, unfortunately, the, the future just hit us really hard because we are out of time. Oh, wow. This is actually the, uh, the, the end of the hour. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm just astonished, uh, President Herbowski, at, at how much you've shared with us and how much you've given. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. you know, the, the line we always leave with is keep hope alive. Oh, that's a good one. Hope alive. It's very important. It's not original, but it's so profound. It keep is. Hope alive. It is. But don't don't leave yet because I wanted to ask you, what's the best way for us to keep up with you? Uh, should we just uh, if you up? you know uh, if you go just if you if you look at the UMBC homepage, mm -hmm. you see everything I'm doing all the time, and, and you can just Google Rabowski. I'm talking somewhere all the time. This is my 30th year as president. So I've been very fortunate, very fortunate. 30. 30. Very, very fortunate. Oh my gosh. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we will follow. And uh, we're looking forward to your next book too. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. everybody. Now don't go friends because we need to point you out to uh, uh, the next couple of weeks. Uh, but thank you uh, for all of your really, really good questions. Um, just looking ahead for the next few weeks on the forum, uh, we've got uh, a manifesto for how to teach better online. We have another session on equity, improving education equity for black students, uh, a session on sparking conversations about emerging educational technology, a session on mentoring and professional development, and still more. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to learn more. Uh, you can also keep talking about all of these issues, how to partner with outside of, of a campus, how to best implement and support social justice in a mixed virtual and physical environment and more, just head to Twitter and use the hashtag FTTE. And my blog as well will have comments there. If you'd like to look back into our previous sessions on any of these topics, just head to our giant archive at YouTube. Go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. And that's it for today. Thank you all so much for your thoughts, for your conversations. This has been a terrific session. I hope all of you take away a lot of thoughts and a lot of inspiration. And above all, I hope you all stay safe. Take care. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>